Hello and welcome. My name is Joe Cass, Senior Director, S&P Global Ratings, and the host and creator of the FI15 podcast. So today I'm talking to David Rubenstein, co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group, and Adam Kanzler, President at S&P Global Market Intelligence. Today we're going to be talking about private markets, the world's greatest investors, data, success, and regrets. But just a quick reminder before we kick off that the views of the external guest are their views alone and they do not represent the views of S&P Global Ratings. Okay, great. David, we just said this off camera, but you are actually the first ever guest to appear twice on the Fixed Income in 15 podcast. So first of all, thank you very much and welcome back. My pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me. So last time you came on, um, doesn't seem like this long ago, but it was, it was in October 2020. So interested to know how the kind of unique set of circumstances um, since then may have changed your views of markets, market dynamics. And to put it bluntly, do you think there's going to be a recession in 2023? Of course, nobody really knows if there's going to be a recession in 2023. Uh, I think about a year ago, the general consensus in the financial world was that it would be very difficult to avoid a recession. Uh, I think the consensus in the last few months has been that it's more likely than not we would be able to avoid a recession. Though I would say in the last week or two, uh, people are getting a little bit more negative about their, our ability to avoid a recession. So the truth is, nobody really knows. I interviewed Jay Powell recently. Obviously, he doesn't know. Uh, the only way that you will know if you're in a recession is uh, when the, the government officially calls it a recession. I, I just don't know. But I would say that we are doing reasonably well in the United States, and we are reasonably in control of our own economic situation with respect to interest rates and so forth. We can't control what happens in Ukraine, what happens in China, what happens in the Middle East or other parts of the world where there might be um, geopolitical events that will hurt our economy to a certain extent. So if you told me that the war in Ukraine was going to get uh, even more difficult than it is now and it's going to last for another year, I would say that's not good for our own economy. If you told me that China were going to invade uh, Taiwan, uh, that wouldn't be good for our economy. So it's just too hard to know. But I, I also want to remind people that a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. There are obviously other definitions, but that's a simplistic definition of it. But it's not the end of the earth. We typically have them throughout our history about once every seven years or so. So we really haven't had one for quite a while, not counting what happened uh, uh, you know, about a year ago when we had two consecutive quarters of negative growth. It was not considered a, re a recession for a lot of reasons. So I wouldn't say it's, it's the most uh, uh, feared thing in the world uh, or the most uh, t terrible thing that can happen to us if we have a recession. We'll get through recessions as we always do. Our bigger problem is whether the government seems to have some solution to the recession when if it does come and whether the government is actually operating in an efficient, effective way. I think the biggest geopolitical problem that I think the U.S. government faces is the inability of the government to work in a functional way. Um, obviously, Congress is controlled by different uh, houses, uh, different parties, and the, and the White House is controlled by, a, you know, Democratic Party. The House is controlled by the Republicans. So if you could ever get the government to work together efficiently and effectively, that would be the best thing that could happen to avoid recessions and other kinds of things. And final comment is the debt limit uh, bill. Uh, we obviously are going to have to uh, perils of Pauline to deal with whether we're going to ex uh, pass the debt limit extension bill or not. If we were to not, for some reason that I can't foresee today, not pass the debt limit extension bill on time, that would produce a recession for sure. Adam, thank you very much for joining. Would you be able to provide an introduction to yourself, your background, and also what you're looking to achieve as president of S&P Global Market Intelligence? Thanks, Joe. Um, I've had a fantastic career. I spent about 16, 17 years as a corporate lawyer doing mostly M&A work, working with a lot of private equity funds, doing acquisitions and dispositions, a lot of times for banks. So I developed a special specialization in bank regulatory and where it intersects with M&A corporate activity. That led me to a group of founders that were starting a company that was collecting credit default swap data from banks, forming a new venture with many banks as partners. 
comp small company called Market. That evolved to IHS Market, merged with S&P Global. Here we are today, and I'm running our Market Intelligence Division. Um, today, the largest division of S&P Global and a real powerhouse of information, data, and analytics. My goal as we go forward is to harness all of the capabilities we have and start to deliver to our customers in new seamless ways, putting data sets together, delivering to our customers as they want it, and providing customers with the kind of workflows that make what they do much more efficient, much more data informed, streamlined, um, all the kinds of things that customers in a rapidly changing technology and data environment need from us. Perfect. Thanks, Adam. David, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on private markets over the past two two-ish years. So given the low interest rate environment, these markets seem to have attracted a whole new audience of investors in search of yield. Now the rate environment is changing. What role do you think private markets could play for institutional investors going forward? Well, private markets, uh, but, but that I assume you're, you're including things like buyouts, venture capital, growth capital, uh, opportunistic real estate and things like that. Over the last 40 years or so, more or less, almost every year, uh, private market investing returns have exceeded public market investment returns. Uh, if you just look at market averages, obviously some years, uh, some classes of private market are better than other years of certain private markets. I think the general uh, consensus now is that if one is going to have a diversified and well-structured investment portfolio, somebody should have in that portfolio some private market-related investments. Historically, investors had a so-called, uh, let's say, 60-40 approach. 60% would be public equities, 40% would be some type of debt. In recent years, I would say the most uh, well-informed endowments and, and private family offices have probably gone to something like, uh, uh, instead of 60-40, they're having maybe 40% in public equities, maybe 20% in fixed income, and maybe as much as uh, 30 or 40% in private markets. Now, because the interest rate environment has gone up so much in the last year or so, many people are now buying treasury bills or other fixed income instruments because the yield is pretty good. And so I suspect private market part of one's uh, overall investment portfolio is probably down a little bit as people increase their public uh, or fixed income and their, and their uh, uh, I'd say, treasury-related kinds of investments. But overall, I would say that uh, private markets are likely to outperform public markets again and even outperform uh, any kind of interest rate in, uh, uh, instrument. Uh, people are probably reducing their exposure to private investments a bit because the interest rate environment is such that it is either harder for some people to think that you can do buyouts, though I'm not sure that's fair, or that you can get the yields that you used to be able to get in private markets. But overall, I think the private market industry is in reasonably good shape. I don't think that all of a sudden private markets are going to disappear as an important part of one's uh, investment portfolio. In terms of doing buyouts, I, I want to remind people that in the early days of buyouts, uh, probably, and this is hard to believe today, 95% of the capital structure was debt and maybe 5% was equity. The famous RJR deal in, in 1989 uh, was 95% debt and 5% equity. Today, buyouts are maybe 50% equity and maybe 50% debt and maybe even 60% equity and 40% debt. And therefore, the interest rate environment uh, is not as, as important as it was because you're not borrowing quite as much money as you used to be able to borrow or you, you did tended to borrow. So uh, I don't think that the buy, the private markets are going to be, uh, or buyout markets can be hurt all that much by higher interest rates, though clearly lower interest rates are better. But I think uh, the market will continue to do buyouts uh, probably at a little bit lower pace than they did when the interest rates were a little bit lower. Thanks, David. And David, in kind of relation to that question on private markets, be interested to know your view on valuations in private markets. So in your view, is there any kind of hidden risk in terms of valuations of private equity funds being lower than expected? Or is this kind of concern more, you know, a storm in a teacup and any kind of recovery could be more predictable and straightforward? In the early days of private equity and buyouts, I would say deals, and I'm talking about the 70s and 80s, let's say, Buyouts were tended to be done at seven to nine times EBITDA multiple or cash flow multiples. 
And with leverage, if you did well, you would make very, very good rates of return, 20% net or higher. In more recent years, uh, as more people have come into the market, EBITDA or cash flow multiples have tended to drift in up to the double digit level. And then so today, 13, 14, 15 times EBITDA multiples are not that unusual. Now, the re returns are going to come down if you're paying those kind of multiples. But I, I think that the returns have come down to levels that are still acceptable. In other words, in the early days of buyouts, people wanted 20% or 25% net internal rates of return. And that was not impossible because of the enormous leverage that was being used and so forth. And interest rates were not that high. As interest rates have gone higher and as EBITDA multiples have gone higher, I think investors have come to expect net internal rates of return of 15 percent or so from their private equity buyout related investments. So, yes, there is a, uh, a result uh, from higher interest rates uh, on returns coming down. But investors have come to accept and be willing to, to, to be pleased with, I would say, net internal rates of return of 15, 16 percent. And the buyout world is basically uh, doing its deals, uh, assuming those are the kind of rates of return it's trying to get from uh, from from the investments it's making. People are no longer pro forming the deals and going to investment committees saying, here's a 25 percent net internal rate of return deal. If somebody did that, they wouldn't be taken seriously. So Adam, S&P Global Market Intelligence is heavily involved in helping out clients on the data and the workflow side within private markets. So how have you seen the needs of your clients develop in this space? And where do you see future opportunities for data and workflow in the private market space? Thanks, Joe. As David touched on, this is a continually growing asset class. We've seen inflows, even in 2022, where inflows slowed to some extent, you're still seeing an expansion of capital available for investment in private markets, whether private equity, private credit, real estate, other asset classes. I think as those markets continue to grow and as you see larger and larger allocations to these asset classes from um, all different types of investors, from pension funds, even to now more individual investors in those asset classes, all of the demands for transparency, data, valuations, and audit trail, understanding those portfolios, being able to take the relevant data and information out of those portfolios and for customers to use it in their own analytics, whether it's for an LP or a GP, comparing against benchmarks to raise additional capital. These are all places where we have relevant solutions to our customer set. The, the power of what we've put together at S&P Global is linking many of these capabilities together in order to create the right streamlined workflows and the right comprehensive data sets for our customers to look at everything from sustainability metrics against their portfolios to valuation to timelines for exit, all of the components that a private asset manager might find relevant. Um, I'm very excited about it. It's a growing asset class and we have a really important set of solutions that we're working hard to pull together in a way to make it super efficient for our customers. Thanks, Adam. So David, I've seen you interview a number of Federal Reserve chairs over the years, um, including, as you just said previously in one of the other questions, recently interviewing the current chair, Jay Powell, who is, of course, an ex-employee of Carlyle. So firstly, is it strange seeing someone you hired about 20 years ago becoming the chair of the Federal Reserve? And secondly, how do you think the Fed's thinking and interest rate trajectory could evolve uh, this year? Well, they probably think it's stranger to see me doing interviewing because they didn't think I was an interviewer. Uh, that, that may be stranger to them than my thinking that they became chairman of the Fed. Uh, when Jay Powell was at our firm, I knew he was a very talented person. Uh, I had hired him uh, out of the government when he had left the George Herbert Walker Bush administration. I thought he was a very solid buyout person. He said he wanted to leave and do public service, and he obviously uh, uh, is doing that now. So I won't say strange. Uh, you know, lots of people uh, go into different parts of their of their career when they leave a private equity or investment firm. Uh, Glenn Youngkin left our firm and got elected governor of uh, Virginia. So you just never know what's going to happen. In terms of uh, going forward, I think the interest rate environment is. Uh, is one that uh, is likely to see uh, another increase or two before the Fed is done. Uh, 
I think the Fed is more worried about inflation than it is about a recession. Its job principally is to worry about keeping the currency uh, in reasonably good shape and dealing with inflation. It has other jobs as well. And I think they don't want to be seen as as prematurely taking their foot off the uh, accelerator of uh, interest rate increases. So I suspect we'll see another 25 basis point increase at the March meeting. And I do not think we will see any cuts at the end of the year. I think before the jobs numbers came out uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was expected by the markets that you might see a cut by the end of the year but I don't think that the markets are assuming that anymore, and I'm not assuming that. So I suspect you'll see at least another 25 basis point increase this year and maybe uh, one beyond that if inflation continues to be at uh, levels that the Fed is not comfortable with. Great. Thanks, David. So Adam, data analytics is, is really at kind of the heart of a lot of major decisions across the kind of corporate and the business universe today. How can data and, and technology more broadly continue to transform decision-making? Decision and what could that mean for financial markets? Um, th thanks, Joe. I think anyone who's played recently with chat GPT, and I hope everyone has, because it's really an eye-opener, sees the power of technology, especially when it's applied against very large data sets. It's that kind of power, I think, and combination of technology and data that will drive the next evolution of great decision making in financial markets. For um, for us, the focus is on having the absolute best content, the most accurate, useful, accessible, um, efficiently accessible data sets against which technology can operate to sort, organize, deliver out, and aid in decision making. Whether that's an enterprise data management tool whether that's the application of automation, machine learning, or artificial intelligence against data sets, the linking of data sets to each other, that is um, of tremendous value to many of our customers. I do think, um, although we've seen many technology transformations, I do think we're on the very cusp of a very significant technology transformation as technology creates new mechanisms for accessing vast amounts of data that are more readily available and creating actual actionable insights or enhanced or more efficient workflows for our customers. So th this, is a, this is a space to be very focused on. You see it happening all across the industry. You see the partnerships between financial firms and large technology firms. This is, uh, this is clearly a space to watch over the next three to five years. Perfect. Thanks, Adam. David, last year you published um, a new book, How to Invest. So be interested to know or to hear you talk about the book's origin, what you're looking to achieve, and maybe give a preview of what the most successful investors in the world have in common. Over the years, I've interviewed many uh, people in the financial service industry, and I decided that it might be an interesting idea to take some of the best investors and see what made them so successful. So I interviewed many of the people that I knew or wanted to know who had been really successful as investors. And the people would range from uh, Stan Druckenmiller to Jim Simons to Seth Klarman, people like that who are well known in the industry. Uh, what they have in common is many things, but the principal thing that they have in common is they were willing to defy conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom might be to say, it's now time to sell. They would say, now's the time to buy or vice versa. And so when you get a great investor, he or she is not waiting for an investment committee report of 500 pages from a fresh MBA to come along and say, guess what? I, the fresh MBA, think you should invest in A or B or C. The great investors generally uh, distill the information quite quickly. They know what they believe in, and they're willing to take risks. And by willing to take risk, being willing to take risk, they're also willing to lose money. And every great investor has had bad bets, made bad investments. If you haven't made bad bets or bad investments, you're really not actively investing. So all the great investors know that, that uh, you will take chances and sometimes they'll work, sometimes they won't. But the great investors have made bets that were contrary to conventional wisdom and more often than not, they worked out. Great. And David, you mentioned there, there's, there's a lot of anecdotes in the book from these well-known investors like Larry Fink building BlackRock and Stan Druckenmiller shorting the pound with great success, we should say. Is there kind of one or two of your favorite investing stories um, you've uncovered while interviewing these legendary investors? 
Well, you just referred to one of them, which is Stan Druckenmiller, when he was running uh, George Soros' uh, hedge fund, basically came up with the idea of shorting the British pound, which, uh, in his view, was ultimately going to be uh, um, going down in value. It was it was too heavily valued, in, in his view. So he went to George Soros and said, we're putting a lot of money into this, but I think it's a good idea. And George Soros' general view is investing. If you have a really good idea, do it more than you think you should. Just put enormous amounts of money into something you think is a really great idea because great ideas don't come along. So George Soros wanted him to double down and put a, not, as, twice as much money into it. They didn't actually get as much in before the, the pound actually was devalued. But I, I think it's interesting that that uh, you know very often uh, you have a great idea and, and you regret that you didn't put more into that great idea. Uh, John Paulson similarly had one great idea, which was to short the mortgage market uh, in 07, 08. And he put in essentially all of the money that he had in his fund, plus much more. He made more or less 100 times his money on the, the money that was invested and became probably the single greatest trade uh, in, the tr in the trading world in the last you know, couple dozen years or so. So uh, that's a, you know, it's incredible how he took that risk. And, and nobody else really thought he was uh, you know, going to be making the kind of money that he, he did. So uh, you always find people who made great investments going against the conventional wisdom, as I mentioned earlier. And those are two, two examples, the, uh, the bet against the pound and the bet against the, uh, the mortgage market. Adam, like David, you are a trained lawyer. So you worked in corporate M&A law for you know, nearly 20 years. So what initially attracted to you to the world of law? And is there anything you really miss or conversely anything you're glad to see the back of from the legal world? Joe, I've been blessed with a great career. I loved being a lawyer. I loved the challenge of finding the missing puzzle piece in tough transactions where two sides maybe were close but couldn't quite agree and just finding the way to bring that together. I love the logic of contractual relationships. Um, I never had it. I've never looked back and, and regretted any moment of that. That said, I have no desire to go back. I love what I'm doing today. The association with a group of people pursuing a common objective, what you see at a company, thinking about how to change the way customers approach their own workflows, how to create value, um, that's been really exciting. And in financial markets, it's actually a particularly exciting place because it really operates right on the cutting edge in so many places. So do I miss elements? I love the, I love the cerebral aspects of being a lawyer. I love the aggressive commercial aspects of being in business today. I like what I'm doing today better than anything I've done before. So no desire to go backwards, um, but no regrets of, of anywhere I've been. Great. Thanks, Adam. David, you've had, you know, a host of wins, let's say, in your investing career, lots of success over a long period of time. However, I did wonder if you could share kind of a few instances of investments that you turned down at the time, but then looking back on it, you regret that you turned it down. Sure. Um, I'm going to mention three of them. Um, when uh, Mark Zuckerberg was at Harvard, uh, my now son-in-law told me about Mark trying to raise a, uh, a small amount of money to fund this company. And it was described to me as a dating service, more or less. And I'd seen dating services come and go before. And I said, look, this is not going to go anywhere. Uh, he fortunately, from his point of view, Mark's point of view, got $30,000 from one of his classmates that turned out to be worth at $1.15 billion. So I do regret that not I, I didn't put up that money. Um, when Jeff uh, Bezos was starting uh, his company, Amazon, uh, one of our Carlisle companies was providing the bibliography of books in print that he was using to sell books. Uh, at one point... Uh, uh, we, we basically sold it to him or rented it to him for $100,000 a year. He had offered us 20% of the company at the beginning in, in, as, in lieu of uh, the, the fact he didn't have a lot of cash at the time. We turned that down and said we want $100,000 a year, not some stock in uh, some little company. Uh, later, I decided that was a mistake. I went out and got some stock. Uh, he said he didn't need to give us 20% anymore because the company was off the ground, but he gave us 1% of the company which uh, we didn't think was going to be worth that much. We sold it right at the IPO. Uh, that was a mistake. And last, uh, there was a young man who came into my office one day, uh, I think if I recall, in sandals and jeans, long hair, with a, an executive from, from uh, Silicon Valley, and they wanted to explain to us how they had figured out how to navigate the internet. 
And we said, well, why do we, why would we want to navigate the internet and what is the internet? And uh, we turned down uh, Netscape at the beginning at a valuation of about $125 million. Uh, later was sold for $4.5 billion to AOL. So those are three that I regret because I wasn't smart enough to realize that these other guys really knew what they were doing. Adam, what's the most exciting, the most cutting edge product your team are working on right now at S&P Global Market Intelligence? Yeah, I, I know better than on a public video to call out which of my children I love best. Um, usually they know, but I don't like to say it out loud. We have a lot of great initiatives, particularly in private markets, thinking about the way we can integrate many of the data sets that we have today that are relevant to private asset managers into their regular private asset workflows. So that's an area I'm really excited about. I'm excited about expansion of offerings to corporate customers in particular, helping them manage risk, helping them understand their supply chain. The set of tools we have across the division are, are robust capabilities and deep data sets. I'm very excited about how we pull that together to give customers a more comprehensive view of their risk, their supply chain, and how they should be making decisions. Layered in economic forecasting, regional, um, political, and other types of risks. So this is, um, this is an area where I think we have a lot to offer our customers. I think in areas uh, like sustainability, layering in sustainability information, ESG information into private markets in particular will become more and more important. So I'm excited about the capabilities that we'll be bringing to private markets um, by combining those, those capabilities that we have. I think those, those are a few um, to name. You know, we completed our merger about a year ago. Um, we've discovered so many opportunities in bringing our assets together and launching new products for our customers. We're excited over the course of 2023 for those to start hitting the market. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing our customers' reactions. David, this is a selfish question from me to you. So you host a, kind of a number of successful shows on Bloomberg, which I usually watch on YouTube. And you're interviewing world leaders at a variety of events virtually and now in person again. In your experience, what makes a great interview and what tips do you have for me to maximize the time that you have with guests in these kind of interviews? Well, everybody has to have their own style. And so you shouldn't try to force your style to be somebody else's. So you have to do it in a way that feels natural. Um, what I try to do is read as much as I can about the person and absorb the information. I don't tend to use notes because I feel that when you have notes in front of you, you inevitably look down and that when you look down to use that crutch, you, you lose the intimacy of having a conversation as opposed to an interview. I also remember that what Oprah Winfrey told me once, she said that when I interviewed her, she said, I'm not really a good interviewer. She said, I'm a really good listener though. And so the key is to listen to what the person says and pivot. In other words, if you have a list of questions, but the interviewee says something that's really interesting, it doesn't go in line with what you prepared, then just live, go with what the interviewee is talking about. I also feel that the best interviews I have done are with live audiences because you can play off the live audience um, much better than when you're just in a studio. And also, if you know the person well, you have an intimacy with them, uh, I think it works much better. So the Jay Powell interview you may have seen that I did a, couple, a week or so ago, I've known Jay for you know 20 plus years, so it goes much better. Um, I interviewed recently in a private setting, uh, Tom Brady. I really didn't know him, but he had on the panel with him, was just him and Bob Kraft. Uh, I knew Bob Kraft pretty well, so I could kind of make that relationship work with Tom Brady a bit. But whenever you're interviewing somebody you really don't know, it's always can be a little awkward. Like over the summer, I interviewed Elon Musk, and I wasn't that happy with the interview because I really didn't know him that well. And, um, and I think he didn't know me that well, and I think it was a little more awkward. You're much better off when the person who's the interviewee is relaxed. They don't think you're going to embarrass them. They're willing to open up, and they're willing to tell you things they might not tell somebody else. And obviously, uh, telling humorous kind of stories about their background always makes the, uh, the interview, the, the audience feel that they're getting some kind of insight that they wouldn't normally get. But anyway. No, that's great. I'm sure you're doing a good job. So, uh, but use your own style. And was that interview with Elon Musk in person or was it virtual? Do you think that kind of? No, it, it, it was not. It was uh, it was in person, yes. It was an hour at an Aspen event. 
but he was very busy. And so right before the interview, I didn't get a chance to talk to him. I was supposed to spend an hour with him before. I didn't get a chance to do that. So I didn't really have the relationship with him. I only met him once or twice before, so I didn't really know him. Uh, when you know somebody pretty well, it can go much, much better. Adam, in your spare time, I know you, one of your passions is, is engineering. So making things and taking them apart and putting them back together, both on the electrical and the mechanical side. So can you talk a bit more about what projects you've started and where this passion came from? Yeah, this this is an interest that really came from my childhood. I had a, a father who was actually a, a doctor, but I think he always wanted to be either a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter. Every weekend was filled with hobbies around fixing things, building things. When I was younger, we all, uh, all in our family, we all rode motorcycles. I rode on the dirt. My father rode on the street. Um, this became a, a hobby, and those are those are things you generally fix yourself. So all of the mechanical, the motors, the electrical systems um, just became a hobby. That led to working on cars as well, particularly older American cars, where the equipment was a bit simpler in those days. Today, I open the hood of a car, and there's no chance I could touch anything. But I love that mechanical component. I'm always fascinated by the ability to create mechanical tools, the engineering, the physics behind it, whether it's in a, a motor, a wristwatch, a motorcycle, um, an electrical wiring through a house. I love to do those things myself. I'm careful in the house these days. Um, some of the systems have become very sophisticated. And I'm very sensitive to creating anything that could have any kind of a fire or overload hazard. So I always have a professional check on things like that but simple things i really do i do love doing myself i like the mental challenge and unlike many of the things we do every day projects like that tend to have a beginning a middle and an end and you're done and you feel like it's complete and it's a great feeling so um it's great it's a great thing to do on your week as so david last question goes to you so on this podcast you know over the past it's been nearly three years now i've interviewed leaders influential individuals generally from the world of finance and economics um entrepreneurs like yourself too so thinking about everyone you've interviewed throughout your career or even met throughout your career who would be the kind of a really interesting potential guest i should ask to join a future episode of this podcast well the, the bigger the name the probably the better uh your your audience is going to be so if you can get elon musk that would probably be pretty attractive um, I'd say if you can get uh, a government leader, president of the United States, that would be pretty good. Um, if you can get a head of state from overseas, uh, Xi Jinping, that would be pretty good. But in the realistic world, I think uh, getting people who are interested in being on your podcast is probably more realistic. So you want to get people that have something that they want to say. You're not pulling their teeth and they really don't want to be there. Um, so one interesting thing that I've been trying to think about how to best do is to interview people who are no longer with us. The interview format or the podcast format is relatively, you know, new. Uh, maybe 60, 70 years ago, we didn't, but we, we began the idea of, of interviews as entertainment on The Tonight Show and other kinds of TV shows. But there are no interviews of William Shakespeare. There are no interviews of Henry VIII. No interviews of Cleopatra, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, because people didn't do that in those days. So it would be really good to figure out how you could do an interview that would be interesting. Uh, perhaps somebody plays uh, George Washington, somebody plays Abraham Lincoln, who knows those people well, and do that interview. And it'd be interesting to see what, what they would say. So, you know, I would love to ask Henry VIII, why did you chop off the heads of your, your wives? Why not just get a prenup and just deal with it that way? Or ask Cleopatra, who was a better lover, Mark Antony or Julius Caesar? People would like to know. Or ask William Shakespeare, uh, who really wrote those plays? You can tell us. Uh, we know you couldn't have possibly written them all. So, but you know, we'll have to figure out a way to get those answers some other time. Yeah, no, fantastic. That's a great idea. So, thank you very much to David thank and you. Adam for your time on this uh, session today, and for everyone watching and listening. See you next time on Fixed Income in Fifteen.